we need to move away from coal and gas to a mixture of renewable energy sources. Geothermal is key to that. This is the step change that we needed. We open the valves, the fluid comes out of the ground and it keeps flowing and makes electricity 24 seven. We were bringing power in from outside the region and that power was expensive. With this new station, we make all of our own renewable energy and we export 97% of the time. To be frank, we had other banks decline us and told us that we had to sell down before we could get funding. That wasn't the approach that we had from ANZ, which meant that we could keep it within community ownership, owned by the consumers of the far north, and create a tremendous asset for them. So it's been a fantastic result. Kia ora tātou, no mai, haere mai. My name's Ian Purdy. I'm a board member of Infrastructure New Zealand and the head of property and infrastructure investment at Accident Compensation Corporation. Welcome to this afternoon session, looking at the role of infrastructure in economic recovery. We're privileged to have with us today, ANZ's chief economist for New Zealand, Sharon Zollner. Sharon started her career at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand in 1998 and moved to the New Zealand banking sector in 2006. She joined the ANZ team in 2010 and has been chief economist for the past four years. Sharon is in high demand from both the media and the bank's clients for her views. First up, we have a pre-record of Sharon interviewing the chief economist for the ANZ group, Richard Yitzinger, and ANZ's chief economist for Greater China, Ramit Young. Three chief economists in one presentation. I've had a sneak peek at the session and it's very good. Following that, Sharon will present an overview of the New Zealand economy. Unfortunately, time limitations mean there won't be Q&A at the end of our session, but I encourage you to use the discussion forum to leave comments. Thanks very much to ANZ, our premier sponsor for Building Nations, for making Sharon, Richard and Raymond available to us today. If you'd like to chat to a representative from ANZ, head on over to the sponsor hub at any time. Over to you, Sharon. Thanks. I'm delighted to be joined today by Richard Yetzinger, the Global Chief Economist for ANZ, and Raymond Jung, our Chief Economist for Greater China, just to help us put a little bit of a global context uh, around the role infrastructure can, is playing at the moment and can play in the future. But perhaps to start with, uh, a general economic outlook from our Chief Economist, Richard. Uh, thanks, Sharon, and, and thanks for having me today. The outlook, I think, is pretty, pretty positive. The world maybe is, a, is well is a bit bifurcated in terms of around access to, to vaccines but certainly if we look at uh, the advanced economies um, they're doing very very well we're undergoing i suppose what you'd call something of a great reopening i have my fingers crossed that it sticks uh, this time of course it's occurring with with much higher vaccination rates asia parts of asia are a little bit further behind because of uh, vaccine rollouts but even there there are efforts to try and uh, open borders to get some um, to get some tourists back, um, and, and I think the sum of that is the the world kind of normalising. Um, inflationary pressure as a consequence, I don't think is transitory. I think there's something um, there's something uh, bigger going on. Consider that um, you know New Zealand, uh, the economy is as good as or maybe better in most parts than it was pre-COVID, and yet uh, policy settings very very stimulatory. Um, relative to pre-COVID levels. I think, you know, wherever vaccines can be rolled out with, with a reasonable degree of efficiency, we're going to see very, very strong economic conditions because of those policy settings. Uh, COVID obviously is still a risk, but um, as I say, I have my fingers crossed that uh, we've found its measure. Uh, China, probably the main downside risk. It's not that it looks, uh, you know, really bad, but obviously there are some risks there. Maybe Raymond, over to you for that. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, the Chinese economic outlook contrasts what uh, we just talked about, the general global outlook. Um, in the case of China, we see more downside risk uh, over the next 12 months than, uh, than the upside. Of course, that uh, we all know that the GDP is slowing down and uh, we're not expecting to see uh, any GDP growth of more than 4% this quarter. And next year, um, China will still be running uh, uh, below the potential growth of five and a half, and we're expecting 5.1% growth uh, for 2022. 
Uh, the problem is obviously the public sector um, has been slowing down rapidly in the past few months uh, with the consumption uh, also lagging behind as well. Um, partly because of COVID, you know, in some cases, um, some of the local lockdown is still going on despite um, an increasing uh, vaccination. Uh, but obviously, Beijing has continued to hold a very tough um, and hawkish stand in terms of zero tolerance and do not want to see any case. Um, so the uh, strict lockdown somehow uh, affects consumption. Now, of course, that we know the biggest constraint for the authorities is to ensure a smooth running of Beijing Winter Games next February. So over the next six months um, or so, that we don't see that China is going to relax the travel and uh, the service sector will still be uh, running below uh, the potential. Now, the only positive sign, and indeed it's positive side that also reflect the global recovery is Chinese export has been um, uh, increasing um, by 25% or one quarter um, of, um, of a, on, from a year on year basis because of the tax cycle. So from this perspective, the external side of China will still be very helpful and the coastal region uh, in terms of industrial production will still be pretty supportive um, in terms of the external demand. So certainly the global picture and the Chinese growth picture are very closely intertwined. Uh, so here in New Zealand, Richard, we've had the sharpest increase in mortgage rates over the last six months that we've ever seen. Uh, so that's certainly causing a few people to do a double take. What do you think uh, the reduction of monetary stimulus looks like at the global level? And is that something we should be concerned about? I think it's going to be a nerve wracking time. In fact, that New Zealand experience, I think, is a little microcosm of what policy withdrawal will look like. If you think about the Reserve Bank of Australia, uh, the Fed, obviously, who matters more than everybody else on this issue, uh, the ECB, a range of other central banks have said, we will be late. We want to see inflation. We want unemployment down. We want to see wage growth. Uh, I can't, for, to my mind, it's unavoidable that if you are late, once you start to move, you must move fast. Now, the normal cycle we're used to is uh, you're preemptive, you start easy coming out of a big downturn, you, you move, uh, you assess the incoming news flow, you move again. I don't see how there's room for that when you're starting so late and capacity pressures are already quite tight. And in fact, that's just monetary policy. You add fiscal policy, compare the fiscal response globally this time to that period coming out of the last global downturn, the GFC. Um, in 2009, economies had already started fiscal repair uh, this year, most economies have doubled down on, on fiscal expansion. Um, I think monetary policy uh, normalisation, as it rolls out across different countries, it risks being quite abrupt. I'm not as focused on emerging markets this time, which were a big issue during the taper tantrum. I think the issues are more likely to reveal this, themselves at home and certainly being very conscious of, I guess, the floating rate risk um, that businesses have is going to be something that, that I think people should be focused on. So traditionally, the, the policy solution to a global slowdown or to an economic slowdown is to build something. Uh, and certainly we've seen uh, a lot of infrastructure plans rolled out, but of course they're running smack into the wall of a lack of workers and, and commodity cost escalation that everyone else is. So, so Raymond China has been uh, the undisputed king of infrastructure rollout for, for quite some period. Um, in your view, can a country overdo it or is more always better? Hey Sharon, you use the term of undisputable uh, king of infrastructure investment. Obviously, we have seen that China has been uh, having a very, very strong infrastructure investment after, right after the GFC. Uh, but, but obviously, that's the whole philosophy comes down to uh, national income uh, accounting. That either if you earn some money, you know, from the external side through the export, then whether you're going to spend it uh, as consumption, or whether you're going to invest. As the China chose to invest to sustain growth um, over uh, the next uh, 10 and hopefully 15 years you know, down the road. Now, what they have done uh, so far in the first few years, right after the GFC, um, did increase the uh, productivity, uh, which is good for growth you know, in the longer term. Uh, for example, that the China had built uh, already a very strong high-speed train network that can move people around quite quickly. You know, now that you just need to ten, um, you know, spend uh, one, two hours from Shanghai to Beijing quite easily. 
and uh, people can choose what they want to fly or they, whether they want to uh, go by train. This has been very helpful in uh, for a country with 1.4 billion population. This is to some extent is part of the urbanization plan, considering that China has still be uh, a uh, is still a, a developing country with just 10,000 uh, US dollar per capita GDP. This is still a uh, main philosophy of the authority. Now, of course, that there is they always come with downside risk. Uh, with a strong and massive infrastructure investment. For example, that the debt uh, ratio to GDP has uh, will be approaching 300% um, compared with half of it uh, just a few years ago. So from this perspective, um, the question is whether we should invest or not invest. The question should be where to invest, whether the money is well spent to uh, benefit long-term growth or whether this also just comes to uh, the residential housing and create a big property bubble. So from this perspective, I think that's the question we need to ask for all the policymakers around the world is uh, how wisely we're going to invest in infrastructure. Thanks. So COVID has challenged global supply chains in a pretty meaningful way and, and just in time is becoming just in case. Uh, it is also challenging the provision of infrastructure uh, with, with parts and machinery, for example, in, in very, very short supply. Um, but is there a role for infrastructure in helping fix these supply chains? Perhaps I'll throw this one to you, Richard. Should we be going all out on building more ships, for example, or, or is that going to just result in a glut later on and further problems? Well, of course, building more ships involves lots of steel and they run using lots of fossil fuel. So that, look, there's another there's tangential discussion which goes along with that. COVID obviously has caused supply chain problems. Um, ships are in the wrong place. Uh, crews are in the wrong place. They can't, haven't been able to get vaccines in as timely a fashion. Our consumption has shifted in, in, in favour of goods versus services that, that are um, are sent over ships. I think these things are largely temporary and, and as vaccines roll out and this opening continues, I think they will resolve themselves. But COVID's only part of the supply chain problems, I think. You've got two other issues which are longer lived. One is geopolitics. Um, it's clearly become more important to understand exactly what your supply chains look like. And usually we often use that term in the context of armed forces, but I think businesses really recognise actually you can't be country agnostic anymore. You just need to understand where the risks are in your supply chain, but also climate. Um, as a corporate or a country, you can't make a climate commitment of any sort without fully understanding your supply chain. And I think I think as companies particularly go through that climate uh, uh, examination process, they're not necessarily liking what they see um, when they see how complicated their supply chains are, how many different sources their products come from and where they go. So um, COVID will deal with some of those things. The other ones are longer lived, but it, short answer, no, I don't think it's an infrastructure problem. I think it's um, adjusting to a different world. Yeah, so perhaps we'll continue along that climate change theme. I suppose it's both a challenge and an opportunity in the infrastructure space. In New Zealand, we're looking at, with some alarm, at the amount of infrastructure we have at roughly coastal level <laughs> around the sea and, and what could what the repair bill for that might be. Uh, but also, there's obviously going to be um, a lot of investment required to try and mitigate climate change. What's your view on, on how those things might, might balance out? What are the most important things to think about? Look, I think, I mean, thinking about this issue as an economist, um, climate change needs to result in a, it's a shift in consumption and a shift in investment. In consumption, uh, whether we need to consume less is an open question, but we clearly need to consume less uh, of climate damaging goods and can consume more of, I guess, climate agnostic um, and goods. And to do that, we'll need to radically increase the supply of climate agnostic goods. And that's where the investment um, needs to come in. And if you start to think about what that investment is, a lot of it is infrastructure, um, the electric vehicle infrastructure, uh, the clean energy infrastructure, uh, thinking about different ways of producing food. That may take some government R&D to really help um, lead that process. Uh, I think the infrastructure question is as relevant to climate as it is to economic recovery. I suspect you'll end up with very different infrastructure though. Um, the OECD did some work looking at the fiscal responses to uh, COVID, something around a 2% of global uh, fiscal stimulus uh, they labelled as being, I guess, green, 
or advancing uh, the climate agenda. Look, we need to do much better than that. So Raymond, how about a Chinese perspective? So they've got multiple goals and some of them are starting to look a little bit contradictory perhaps in terms of climate challenges and then energy challenges, and of course the desire to keep growing and common, common prosperity. How do they balance up all of those things and what might that look like in the infrastructure space? Absolutely, and the challenges um, has been pretty obvious that uh, we've known that China um, has gone through a couple of months of power shortage. Um, to some extent, that's the result of decarbonization. On one hand, the government likes to ensure that the household will be able to survive through the winters. Um, but at the same time, they don't like to see the power generator to generate too much power uh, because of the carbon concern. You know, Xi Jinping is very flattered to the world that they really want to commit to uh, the double um, you know, carbonization objective. One is to have the carbonization peak, uh, the emission peak by 2030. The other one is the zero emission by 2060. Now, considering the size of the economy, considering that China is uh, the largest, I would say, polluter or emissions uh, country, that goal is pretty challenging. That, but at the same time, there is no other choice that's uh, based on the current uh, climate change uh, initiatives. They have to do it. They have to proceed. So in terms of how to sustain growth uh, with a limitation of the old economy, I would use this uh, term to label uh, the emission-related industry, then the only way for China is to continue to invest in infrastructure, especially in the digital age. Um, so China has been, uh, is now going to push for a couple of initiatives to be de deleveraging, um, decarbonization under the dual circulations. Um, but the only way out is to pro proceed with the digital uh, economy. So this is the, uh, all the D words um, can, uh, can be seen as the overall package that China, how China want to push for a more sustainable, sustainable growth in the end. Uh, we are living in a digital age and uh, there is no other choice that for us to uh, sustain the long-term growth uh, of a big economy like China. China's been quite important in helping other countries roll out their infrastructure as well. Do you think perhaps China could be uh, a bit of a leader in this, in this new green technology digital space? I'm not sure whether China still want to be perceived as a leader under the current political uh, climate or geopolitical uh, uh, era, but obviously China continues to emphasize on more cooperation with other countries, especially under the Belt and Road initiatives. Uh, of course, that uh, compared with the uh, situation uh, five years ago, that China might still be uh, wanting to invest more in uh, co-related industries, still uh, still um, uh, uh, factories in other countries. But this obviously not the case now, uh, because China also knows that other countries need to commit to the uh, climate um, uh, obligation. So from this perspective, I believe that China will still be uh, invest more and uh, work with other countries to build the uh, transportation network so that China will still be part of the globalization process. But at the same time, they will still be very mindful about what to invest uh, and uh, wanted to uh, provide a win-win situation. And of course, they don't want other countries to run into a debt trap situation. Uh, as many uh, media, you know, uh, propagate in the past few years. Right. Uh, Richard, would you like to have the, the last word or should we leave it there? Look, I think infra this infrastructure question is a very, a really interesting and, and broad question. I mean, one of the trends I'm noticing after COVID, and it's worth reminding every crisis changes some things, and sometimes those, those issues only emerge over time, but there's a, a really big discussion going on globally, certainly in Europe and the US around this question about, you know, what should our cities look like if we're not commuting five days a week? Um, how do we do better in terms of fitting our cities around people rather than designing them to fit cars? And, and uh, there's a quote that I keep thinking about that, that I think says, you know, we need to think about this a bit more deeply also in, um, in our parts of the world. Someone with a one hour car commute needs to earn 40% more to be as happy as someone with a, a short uh, walk to work. And on the other hand, if someone shifts from a long commute to a walk, their happiness increases as much as if they'd fallen in love. I mean, who wouldn't want that? Well, my commute's about two metres from, from my bed to my desk at the moment, so I should be the happiest person alive. <laughs> and I'm sure you're loving it. Yeah. Hey, thank you both so much uh, for taking the time to join us today. Really appreciate it very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, to Richard and Raymond for, for joining us. Uh, so for the New Zealand side of things, I thought I would just uh, give a bit of a, an economic overview of some of the factors that are impacting the infrastructure space um, as well as the economy more generally. So obviously COVID is the place to start. Uh, this chart gives uh, an indication of the level of restrictions that have been in place for various economies over the last year and a half. Um, and you can see that New Zealand had a great run. Uh, with the orange line there at the bottom. Uh, we've leapt to the other end of, of the table, uh, though it doesn't look quite up to date for the easing of restrictions that we've had. But um, it is certainly true that we've gone from one extreme to the other. Uh, but we have gone through a very, very long period of, of less restrictions than most others and uh, been able to fortunately avoid COVID until there were vaccines available. So a lot less um, economic scarring, health scarring than uh, many other countries are facing. So. We should try and bear that in mind as we uh, do the hard yards in, in the months ahead. Um, but the cumulative damage from the current restrictions uh, is, is becoming evident. I think some of it won't become clear until next year, perhaps when the, when the immediate fiscal support is um, reduced. But the vaccination battle that we're seeing now, it's going to be a repeated game. Um, and unfortunately, the regions and the demographics uh, that are already poorest are likely to see the lowest vaccination rates um, and therefore the, the strongest restrictions over the period ahead. Um, so it is all pretty unfortunate in the way it's going to land quite unevenly um, across populations. That's something we've seen globally. Uh, but you can see here our vaccination rates. The numbers that are quoted are percentage of the health service user population age 12 plus, um, which is a lot smaller than just the number of people in New Zealand. If you look at the latter, um, then we're actually about 74% fully vaxxed and 67% uh, second, uh, sorry, 75% fully vaxxed, yes, and first dose and 67 fully vaxxed. So uh, that's a lot of people who are not fully vaccinated uh, across the whole economy. And as mentioned, they uh, tend to be in clumps, which is exactly what you don't want in terms of disease transmission. Um, so it is a slow motion drag race, but um, businesses on the whole, uh, are keeping their chins up. Um, the indicators for activity are down. Uh, they slipped a little further in the preliminary November results, but on the whole, um, looking at a historical context, they're not bad. And certainly they're nothing like the plunge we saw last year when we went into lockdown. We were all wondering if the world was ending and, and how on earth it was all going to pan out. Uh, monetary and fiscal policy, of course, leapt into action, and you can see the bounce out of that trough uh, was extremely dramatic. Um, and if anything, indeed, we've had a period of over-exuberance um, as a result. Um, but that does mean that a lot of businesses have been sitting on quite good balances of cash after a much better year than expected. Uh, but, the, but the hospitality sector and parts of, of retail, parts of construction um, are, are starting to feel the pinch, perhaps. Uh, the strongest activity indicator is actually employment intentions. And I think that's because firms are realising that if they let their staff go, good luck to them replacing them because the labour market is the tightest it's ever been in terms of uh, recorded history, which, uh, you know, a few decades worth. Um, so you can see here that back in March, in February 2020, the Reserve Bank thought the labour market was about at par. Um, and whew, now we're about 50% higher than that. Um, so this is just simply the number of jobs being advertised divided by the number of people who are ostensibly looking for them, who are, well, currently unemployed. Um, so we've, what we've seen is an unemployment rate at a record low of 4.3, despite a record high labour force participation rate. And that's pretty impressive that more and more people are in the labour force, um, either lured in by all these wonderful opportunities or else pushed there by the fact that their cost of living has increased so much. Um, and yet there's still a real shortage of workers. Uh, so you can say, oh, that's because we closed the border, for example. But this is a global phenomenon. But the New Zealand experience is different because in um, other countries, the labour force participation rate has, has dropped right away. Uh, and that is a risk here too, uh, because people with fragile health and customer-facing roles, particularly if you're near retirement, are likely to just weigh up the pros and cons of continuing to work and, and decide actually enough on the stop. So um, the upshot is that labour supplies probably not going to be um, enhanced in terms of participation rate going much higher and indeed it might drop. Uh, and also net migration, 
Um, we're going to open up the borders. We'll get a flood of people in, but it's also entirely possible we'll see a flood of people out. Uh, it's very hard to know how those big movements are going to net out. Uh, but as long as the labour market is tight, we are expecting higher wage inflation than um, the unemployment rate might ordinarily suggest, particularly since inflation expectations are so high. Households are anticipating inflation of over 6%. So if they get a wage increase of any less than that, they'll be highly aware that they're going backwards. Um, and of course, how high your personal inflation rate is depends on what you spend your money on. And it's the necessities that have gone up the most, food, transport, shelter. So um, the lower wage income earners have, had, have faced the biggest hit to their cost of living. Uh, but the Reserve Bank's out on a bit of a limb talking about hiking rates. And this chart really shows why. You can see that uh, the jobs in New Zealand are back not only where they were, but back at trend. Uh, whereas in Australia and in the US, even though their labour markets are very tight, uh, the actual number of filled jobs is well below par. And so their central banks are in full denial mode, essentially, um, and pushing back against market expectations that they might need to tighten monetary policy soon. So it is interesting because if you plot New Zealand and US CPI inflation, you can barely tell them apart. And not just at the moment, but over the last 10, 15 years. And yet the response of the two central banks has been very, very different. And I think it comes down to this, the state of the labour market. So, of course, the Reserve Bank's had one upward surprise after the other, and not just them. Uh, we, we all underestimated the power of monetary policy and the success that the fiscal stimulus would have through the lockdowns in terms of, of uh, a very rapid bounce back in confidence. Um, so, but unemployment is a lagging indicator and it may be uh, the last hurrah of this long series of pleasant surprises about how strong the economy is. So that's not to say things are about to go splat, um, but headwinds are gathering, not least of which is, of course, that while Auckland's looking forward to easing restrictions, the rest of New Zealand is waiting for the hammer to fall. And no matter what system you're under, life without COVID is better than life with COVID. Um, so it, it, it's, from here, we think it's probably a bit more balanced in terms of um, how the market's going to weigh up, whether the Reserve Bank needs to do a lot more than they expect because inflation is higher, or whether they might not need to do as much as they are currently expecting because perhaps the housing market cools more quickly than expected, for example. Uh, so there's the net migration statistics. Australia is desperately keen for workers as well. Uh, they have higher wages and in some places cheaper houses. So typically when the Australian labour market is very strong, um, we do tend to see negative net trans-Tasman migration. So that's just sitting out there as a risk. Our, our forecast is that um, net migration will be positive, but not a great deal of certainty about any forecast about migration at the moment. Household debt is record highs as a relative to incomes. That's the continuation of a long-term trend. Uh, mortgage lending is up nearly 20%. So in that context, higher interest rates will really hurt. So essentially in our forecast, we think the Reserve Bank has got a big job to do, but that they've got a very, very big hammer um, that the interest rates will have quite an impact on the household sector quite quickly. Um, currently, debt servicing costs are low because interest rates have been so super low, even though debt is high, but mortgage rates are moving up quite rapidly now. Um, and so, so we think that will have quite an impact on discretionary spending. Um, we're not suggesting it's going to cause a housing crash or anything like that, but not when the labour market's so tight. But households will become a bit more price sensitive and retailers will find it more difficult to push those cost increases through. That won't be any fun for them, but that sand in the gears of the inflation process is what the Reserve Bank needs to introduce at this point. And even though inflation has been, well, it was kicked off at least by supply problems, um, import shortages, building construction, you know, construction goods, uh, the whole, whole shebang across the economy. Um, it's become broader than that now in so far as it's into wages and inflation expectations. Uh, but here you can see household willingness to buy a major household item is tanked in the last two months. Um, so, well, why is that? We um, don't ask them in this survey, but the US survey they do, and they, the cost of living. Uh, was mentioned and it was put on Joe Biden, not on uh, Powell, not on the Fed. It was the politicians wearing it. Politicians, is, uh, sorry, inflation is a really political issue. Uh, but if you think about the reasons why households might be warier now about buying a major household item than a few months ago, there's no shortage of candidates. There's interest rates are higher, prices are higher, not just for the good you want, but for just general living. Uh, there's supply shortages. So if you want a fancy fridge, you probably haven't even got the model that you want. 
there's the COVID uncertainty uh, and there's the fact that the days of the of your house earning enough money to pay for that nice major household item um, might well be over. So working on the other side, you've got the strong labour market, but you've got real wages going backwards, even though the labour market's incredibly tight. So essentially, retailers have been pleasantly surprised by the strength of retail sales between the two lockdowns, uh, but we think that uh, it's, they're more likely to be disappointed next year. I mean, there's going to be completely crazy lockdown noise in the data. I mean, just look at that chart, it's gone bananas. Uh, and that'll continue for a while. So it'll be quite hard uh, to get the true pulse of spending. But I think um, the Consumer Confidence Survey is trying to tell us something. Another chart with a normally very reliable relationship that's broken down uh, is house sales and house prices. So you can see house prices are up 31, whereas the fall in house sales would be suggesting it should be more like 4, four or 5%. Um, and so basically listings have dropped so much that it's kept the price tension in the market. There's also been a long pipeline of first home buyers who are increasingly delighted that they're actually managing to buy a house now um, as investors have stepped back. But once we get through that queue, um, we, we expect that demand and supply to come into balance. And there is a risk that could happen more abruptly than expected. Uh, so here's our forecast, but take it with a grain of salt because house prices have been pretty impossible to forecast for the last little while. Um, but essentially, uh, some very big increases are going to drop out of that annual price change uh, equation. And so that, that fall is pretty much baked in unless we start seeing record high increases in house prices on a month-to-month -month basis, which seems pretty unlikely at the moment. Um, but the headwinds for housing, well, there's those headwinds I mentioned for consumer spending, but you can add into that the house prices have become ludicrous, the, the rising OCR, the tighter loan-to-value restrictions, the uh, looming introduction of debt-to-income limits, the fact that banks will inevitably increase not only um, current mortgage rates, but the, the rate at which they test that you'd still be able to pay your mortgage, which means you'll be able to borrow a bit less. Uh, the tax change means that you know investors are now facing a tax increase as rates go up. Boosted supply, we're building houses all over the place. Uh, and Auckland is shrinking. First fall in Auckland population uh, in, on record, and over 40% of dwelling consents are in Auckland. Uh, and it could possibly be that the national population will start shrinking. So we're making massive inroads into the housing shortage, which is great, uh, but it's a downside risk for the housing market, obviously. We're not seeing a fire sale of investment, investor properties, uh, but if they're hanging on because they think they're going to time their run perfectly and get the absolute peak moment to sell, and they all think that this moment has come at the same time, uh, then you, you could see that demand supply rebalance uh, realign uh, a little more quickly than anticipated. Uh, but our forecast is not a house price crash. Basically, as long as the labour market is tight, then um, very few people are going to be put in a must-sell situation. But if we saw something like a 2008 come along, then the housing market would be very fragile after increasing 30, more than 30% in a year. That is not a sign that it's bulletproof and unstoppable. That is actually a sign that it's now very fragile. Uh, there's the dwelling consents, as you can see, strong in Auckland, but really across the board. Construction is actually more than 10% of employment now. It was only 5% in the 1990s. So it does have a big impact on the national labour market as well. Cost increases are extreme. Don't have to tell this audience that. Uh, labour, materials, the whole shebang, it's very difficult to get a fixed price contract, which, um, and when you do get a cost indication, it's likely to be higher than you were expecting. So we are seeing some of that pipeline of future projects just start to thin out a little as people are reassessing whether this really is a good time to redo their kitchen or not. Uh, and indeed we've seen residential and commercial building intentions tip over a little, might be partly because of supply shortages as much as um, demand factors. Um, house prices have been a pretty much a one-way bet for 30 years relative to incomes, but that's been because interest rates have been pretty much a one-way bet for 30 years. Obviously there's more to it than that, but essentially if nominal interest rates are falling, then the amount the bank is willing to lend you um, it goes up just relative to your incomes, just mechanically. Um, and so just just a warning shot there that this that top line is, is why people think housing is unstoppable and you should always buy the biggest house you can and borrow as much as you can and never sell a house and all the rest of it. It's based on a very unusual historical period. Um, it's not normal that interest rates do that for 30 years and, and as you can see, we're practically at zero now. Um, and so the days of endless increases in house prices relative to incomes are probably behind us.
Uh, and swap rates have jumped quickly. So basically the OCR moves and that will affect the, the floating mortgage rate, for example. But the one year, two year, three year, they depend on what the Reserve Bank is expected to do over those times. So although the Reserve Bank's only raised rates by 25 basis points, those wholesale interest rates have lifted by a lot more than that. And that's gone straight into mortgage rates. Um, and so while it's going to be a bit, get a bit harder for the Reserve Bank to carry on raising rates as perhaps if, if the consumer starts doing it a bit tougher, uh, they we think they'll keep raising the OCR steadily to a peak of 2% by the end of next year. All going well, of course, always. That's a, um, a, it's all contingent on that. Uh, dairy price is doing very well, part of a bigger global uh, theme of strong food prices. Suits New Zealand well, not great for the globe, not great for poor countries. Um, but very valuable at a time when obviously tourism is, is out for the count. New Zealand dollars behaving itself very well so far, um, even though the Reserve Bank of New Zealand is out on the limb globally. A bit on inflation pressures, you can see cost expectations, pricing intentions, inflation expectations, all pointing one way. Businesses' inflation expectations actually jumped in November to 4.3%, which is uh, more than double the middle midpoint of the Reserve Bank's target range. Um, so that, that's quite something. Households are expecting inflation to start with a six. And discount that, your peril, because the households actually win the forecasting award for the last six months. They've known exactly what's going on. Um, but that pricing attention start is also record highs and consistent with inflation um, heading up towards 6%. So the Reserve Bank does need to get on with it. Um, and it's going to be a bit of a challenge because even as growth disappoints, if that's because of supply side factors, then that doesn't mean inflation is going to drop away. Um, that's the nasty thing about su negative supply side shocks. Um, so households are expecting inflation, retailers are expecting to raise their prices, so everyone's on the same page. Uh, and that kind of circularity is exactly what uh, the Reserve Bank will be wanting to, to interrupt. We, As I said, we do think the, Res the Reserve Bank has the tools to deal with this. What fun, um, you know, to tighten monetary policy is basically trying to persuade people to pull their heads in. It's not a, not a fun process at all, but we think it'll work. So um, you can see there we've got inflation dropping away and implicit in that also is shipping costs and the like uh, starting to normalise. It's obviously taking much longer than expected, but there are some tentative signs that it's starting to turn. Uh, there they are, actually. Yeah, so you can see um, we've started to see um, prices at least stop increasing. Uh, if not drop away a, a huge amount. Those shipping costs have added an awful lot to import prices and made life very challenging for exporters as well. It's not just the cost, but also delays and just getting your stuff onto a ship or onto a plane. Um, it's causing a lot of disruption across the board. And it's a global issue. Basically, uh, the whole world decided to buy a spa because they couldn't go on holiday. Uh, and when everyone does something like that at the same time, it just causes complete pandemonium. So there's our forecast for the cash rates. We think 2% is probably enough. Uh, the market, the light blue line, they're thinking uh, they may need to do more. Some other forecasters are also suggesting uh, the OCR will need to go higher. Um, can't, and the grey line there is what the Reserve Bank was thinking in August. We think they'll lift that significantly. Um, and so we could see a bit more volatility in interest rates over the next couple of weeks. Um, but, yeah, just to get the OCR to two, that takes, um, takes quite a long time. Time. Um, and so, yeah, as I said, a lot needs to go right. And it's not just in New Zealand that uh, central banks are starting to have to think about tightening up policy again, um, which will just immediately challenge some asset values, whether you're talking about um, equities or Bitcoin or, or anything else. Um, if interest rates go up, then the maths can change. Uh, but you can see here that the Reserve Bank's out on the limb, not quite such a limb as it was. The others are starting to come into line. Um, but, but basically, yeah, I've been having fascinating talks with foreign investors who think New Zealand's gone mad and, and we think the rest of the world's gone mad. But we are gradually getting onto the same page, which is that inflation is a problem and it's not going away on its own. Uh, and finally, just a point that while the monetary and fiscal response was incredibly effective, it didn't magic up growth out of thin air. It basically we borrowed from our own futures. So you can see the government debt has taken quite a big step up um, and so too has household debt. So that's fiscal and monetary policy in action. And at some point uh, that will have to be paid back. Obviously our government debt is still really low in a global comparison, 
Um, but our household debt is not. Um, and so basically, whether you're a household or a government or a firm, if you've got an awful lot of debt, then you are less nimble when, when trouble strikes. Um, and this is an issue that many other countries are going to be grappling with. China, for example, there's, as, as Raymond talked about, there are issues in their property development sector. The government has tended to use the housing market as a lever to just turn on growth whenever they need it. But at some point with debt, you may find yourself pushing on a string uh, if people are um, maxed out um, in terms of their debt. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much. That was a bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, but there is uh, another session this afternoon that will uh, talk a little bit more about some of the supply side challenges that the globe is facing at the moment. Can't see any uh, resolution in the near term, uh, but this too shall pass. Hey, thanks so much, Sharon, for that excellent review of the New Zealand economy. Clearly uh, challenging times ahead. Once again, thanks to ANZ, our premier sponsor for the conference and uh, for providing this informative session. Coming up next, we've got uh, Brad Olson from Infometrics looking at economic challenges in infrastructure.